We welcome you to the online ministry of St. Rona Reformed Presbyterian Church on this, the third Sabbath of February 2021. We trust the Lord has been keeping you well and you have been enjoying the blessings from his gracious hand. As we worship God, we read together from the metrical version of Psalm number 25. To you I lift my soul, you Lord my strength will be. My God, let me not be ashamed, nor foes gain victory. Yes, none who waits on you will be ashamed at all, but those who sin without a cause, let shame upon them fall. Show me your ways, O Lord, your paths, O teach to me, and lead me also in your truth, let it my teacher be. For you are God who sends salvation unto me, and all day long on you I wait with great expectancy. Your tender mercies, Lord, remembered let them be, and loving kindnesses, for they are from eternity. And as we come to study God's word again this morning, it is that prayer, show me your ways, O Lord, your paths, O teach to me, and lead me also in your truth, let it my teacher be. May that be our prayer this morning as we come to God's word. Let us unite together in prayer. <clears throat> our gracious God and loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the words of this psalm. We thank you, Father, that the psalmist was looking to you at a time when there were those who were perhaps against him, who were struggling against him. And Father, he realised that in you he would never be confounded, he would never be uh, discouraged, that you were there for him at all times. And Father, he was asking that you might lead and guide him and teach him from your word, that he might be able to put that into practice in his life. And as we come to you today, O oh Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have given us your word in our own language, Father, and we pray, Lord, that as we would read and study it together this morning, that you would richly bless it to each one of us and help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives in every situation in which we find ourselves. Father, we come to you and we have to confess that even at our best we are but unprofitable servants. And we ask, O oh God, that you would teach us afresh and help us, Lord, to be uh, more worthy of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Father, we would look to you now and we pray, Father, that you'd be with us in these days when we are still not able to meet in our own building. We ask, O oh gracious God, that you would uphold and strengthen us each one. We ask, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would help us as we would seek to reach out in these days of lockdown when we cannot do our ordinary outreach. Help us to see, Lord, that you are still building your church and you have ways and means beyond our greatest expectations of bringing men and women to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray now that you would help us take away, Father, from us any distracting thoughts. Forgive us again for our sin and our unworthiness and lead us ever closer to the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we ask these things. Amen. Let us read the Word of God. We read from Acts chapter 22. We read from Acts chapter 22 and we read from verse 6 in the chapter. The context is that Paul and a number of friends have been in Jerusalem uh, and Paul has been arrested in the temple by Jewish people. Uh, they have believed that he has brought a man called Trophimus into the Jewish temple which was against their law because Trophimus was a Greek man and he wants to give uh, a defence of what he has done and of uh, the cause for which he has been uh, arrested. And he says this in verse 6 of chapter 22. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. 
And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptised and wash away <coughs> your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I am imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until that word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander, commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And we pray that God would bless to us that portion from Acts chapter 22. And we turn over to uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, and we read verses 1 through to 7. Ephesians chapter uh, 3 and verses 1 to 7. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by his Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. And we end the reading there at the end of verse 7 and pray that God would bless the reading of his word to each of us. We want to look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1 uh, this morning and I have given this sermon the title Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus. The year 2020 uh, which is now going into eternity has been for all of us a year that has perhaps made of some of us feel as though we were like prisoners in our own homes. For those who were self-isolating and living on their own, it has been a long year. But at least in our homes we have a number of rooms uh, that we can walk through and maybe even the opportunity to go outside into our garden or perhaps down our avenue or our road for a walk. I have had the opportunity to visit someone in prison on a number of occasions. The outside of the building was not as daunting as I had assumed that it might be. It was only when I got into what I might recall the reception of uh, that prison and up to the desk that I found I had to hand over my car keys 
I had to hand over any pens that I might have in my pockets. I had to hand over my wallet and anything else that I had, with the exception of the little Bible that I kept for having worship with the prisoner and my handkerchief. Everything else was taken away from me. Now, if that was not bad enough, each steel gate that I went through had to be opened by a prison warder. And after I and he had gone through, then it was locked behind us. And when you go through about six of these steel gates and each one thuds closed behind you and you hear that lock turning, I have to admit, I began to wonder, would I ever get out of here? And eventually we were shown into a large room and we waited for the prisoner to be brought to see me. Although I had gone to visit him, he had to be brought from his cell. Even here, we were not on our own as there were, was a prison warder watching us all the time. And as I think of that number, that, that prison visit uh, on that one occasion and a number of others subsequent to it, I began to feel a little bit like the Apostle Paul. I knew what it was like for him then, uh, as he writes here, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. I could just sense how he felt, in a sense, hemmed in. But the difference between Paul and myself was Paul could rejoice in that very fact, whereas I felt that I was almost entrapped in the prison, although I knew that I had done nothing wrong and the prison warder would eventually come, open all those gates again, give me back all of my belongings and I could go back out to my car and drive off. I want you to see uh, three things this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, the cause of Paul's imprisonment. Look at what he writes here in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Now, what has he been speaking about in the previous verses? There is a connection here for this reason. He has been speaking about Christ being our, our peace. He has been speaking about Jews and Gentiles being members of that one church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been speaking about Jews and Gentiles being saved in exactly the same way. He has been speaking about Jews and Gentiles being uh, redeemed by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He has been speaking about all of these things and it is Jews and Gentiles uh, that he has been showing are members of the Church of Christ, that they are now making up one new man. And he is saying, it is because of you Gentiles that I am a prisoner here. Now, I want you to remember the position in which Paul found himself. He is a prisoner. Yes, that's clear from what he writes. But he's not a prisoner of uh, the Roman Empire, uh, great though it was. He's not even a prisoner of the emperor of Rome, Nero, at that time. Uh, but he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He's most likely chained to at least one guard, one soldier, but most likely two, who, tr who go with him wherever he wants to go uh, in that rented house in which he lives. He wasn't in a jail as you and I know it today. Uh, or even in those days in which he lived, but he was in his own rented house and people were allowed to come and visit him. Now, Paul had desired to go to the church in Rome. He had desired to go and visit them, to encourage them, to teach them, to instruct them. And at the same time as he was encouraging them, as he would listen to them what they were doing for the outreach of the gospel and the kingdom of God, he would be encouraged by them. He says this in Romans chapter 1 and verses 10 to 12. Making request of by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged by the mutual faith both of you and me. He had thought that the Lord might open up the door of him being able to go and teach in this church that he might be able to travel to Rome itself and openly preach the gospel, openly preach the word and teach the word and evangelize in that great city. But when he did reach that city, it was as a prisoner. But why did he become a prisoner? And the answer to that question is found in the book of Acts. Paul has been on his missionary travels and he has 
come back to Jerusalem and uh, the Jews there have thought that he has uh, brought Trophimus, a Greek, into the temple which was forbidden and they arrest him, they pull him out of the temple and there's a great uproar in the city. The centurion rescues him from the mob, mob and then he starts to give a defence as to why, who he is and what he is. Now remember that this man who was about to speak to this mob at one time had been an ardent nationalist, a Pharisee, one who hated the Gentiles, uh, and uh, yet he was the man who was sent to this very race of people. And as he gave his defence and as he spoke of how God had saved him and spoken to him on that Damascus roadway, and had even spoken to him in Jerusalem to tell him getting out of Jerusalem, if he'd only preached the gospel to the Jews, all of may, may have remained well for him. And the opponents of the gospel may well have tried to live with this new sect of which Paul was a member, that sect they named as the Way. It was when he mentioned that the gospel was also for the Gentiles, that the God of Israel was also interested in the Greeks, in the Gentiles, in those who did not have Jewish blood flowing in their veins, that they were incensed. It was when he said that Jews and Greeks could be one, and that God was interested in both, that that mob in Jerusalem sought to do him harm. Acts 22, verses 21 and 22. Then he said to them, that is God, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. God had said, depart from here, I will send you to the Gentiles, to take the gospel to them, this message of salvation in Christ alone, which, as I said, the Jews might have well been prepared to live with if it had only been they who had been mentioned in Paul's address. But Paul goes on, and they listened to him, or Luke goes on, and they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow, for he is not fit to live. He had to be rescued by a centurion from the lynch mob who sought his life. And he may have been eventually set free to preach the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles, presumably outside of Jerusalem, had he not appealed to Rome, to Caesar, to hear his case. And when he stood before Agrippa in one of those provincial hearings in Acts 29, 6 and 29, and when he'd given us testimony in defence of the gospel, so much so that Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, Paul's reply was that he wished that in every way that Agrippa was like himself, in other words, that he was a believer, except for the bonds that now uh, were around, presumably his hands and his feet, those things which bound him. Now, we today do not find ourselves physically bound and in prison for preaching the gospel today. In many other countries in our world, our brothers and sisters are arrested. They are thrown into prison. They are persecuted for speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to pray for them. We need to pray that the Lord would encourage them, that the Lord would help them, that the Lord would build them up, that the Lord would keep them safe, that the Lord would help them to endure all of these things. And in the midst of all of their trials, of whatever form they are taking, that they might be able to rejoice, that they might be able to like, be like Paul and Silas, in that jail in Philippi, who at midnight, we are told, they sang praises uh, to God. And the result of uh, them singing uh, in the jail and of what God would later do through the earthquake was that the Philippian jailer was saved and others in the city as well. Now, in these days of being locked in with COVID-19, we may very well feel as though we are in some kind of a prison. And if we feel like that, we still have the opportunity to praise God. We still have the opportunity to thank him that the COVID-19 has not struck us down, has not come to our doors, into our homes. And we have the opportunity to help others. Just as people came to Paul's rented house, so we have the opportunity to help others. And perhaps we could consider sending a letter to someone who is shut in of perhaps making a phone call to someone who is isolated, to someone maybe living on their own, 
or sending a text message to someone to let them know that we're thinking of them and praying for them. You see, we have a whole new world of opportunities that are opening up for us by us being imprisoned uh, with COVID-19. And I wonder, are we taking those opportunities and are we seeking to speak uh, to everyone? So first of all, then, the cause of Paul's imprisonment. And then the recognition of God's purpose in his imprisonment. Now, some might have thought that God had got it wrong in sending Paul to Rome as a prisoner. But they're absolutely wrong in that assumption. The Lord knew what he was doing. And Paul knew that the Lord knew that what he was doing was right. So he could trust the God in whom he had believed. He had said in Romans 8 and 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. It wasn't just, I mean, what some things work together for good, but we know that all things work together for good. All the circumstances of life, whatever form they take. And that is the hard part for you and me to learn and to put into practice in our lives. It's hard for us to see God's hand when things go against us. When th things do not go according to our plans and our ideas and what we think is best for us. It is hard to see what his plan, what God's plan is. My mother used to knit what I think was called feral jumpers, uh, especially for my brother and me when we were young and in primary school. Now they were multicoloured, probably maybe five or six, seven colours in them. They were lovely looking, a lovely design. But when you looked at the back of them, there was just a mess of threads. There was no real pattern to it. But look at the front of them. And they showed a lovely design. Just a jumble of threads at the back, but a lovely pattern on the front. And so often, all that we see in God's out working in our lives is that jumble of threads at the back. We cannot understand God's purpose and God's plan. But realise this, God is still in charge. No matter what circumstances in which you find yourself, God is still in charge. And all things, all things, and I stress that, all things work together for good to those who love God. Remember Paul, as he writes to the Philippians in chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13, he indicates to those believers, to those saints in that city, in the city of Philippi that he is a prisoner and he says this but I want you to know brethren that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ notice what he says there his chains are in Christ so he recognizes that God's hand is in this but he says don't worry about me don't be concerned about me. Yes, I know that you are probably praying for me that I'll be released soon and that's good and I like that. But he said, I'm a prisoner here and it's actually turned out for good. It, the gospel has become known to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So as those soldiers were uh, on their route, changed, uh, on a, maybe on a daily basis or on a weekly basis or whatever, he was able to uh, speak the gospel to different people, different soldiers. And they heard the gospel, and it seems from what he writes, it's turned out for the furtherance of the gospel that some of those men have come to faith in the Lord Jesus. You see, he was courageous in proclaiming the gospel to the soldiers, but as others heard him, proclaiming the gospel to those soldiers. They too became courageous and spoke the good news of the gospel to others. It turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So whatever our situation, and I say again, it's unlikely that we shall be in prison, but we might be in prison in a different sense. We may have sustained health issues, we may have domestic difficulties. We may find ourselves, because of COVID, losing our job. 
or difficulty in finding a job, or we may be facing problems that are unresolved. Remember that all things work together for good to those who love God. All things work together for good to those who love God. At present in China, there is sustained persecution of Christians. It has happened because the communist uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party, which is known as the CCP, has found out that there are actually more believers in the Lord Jesus Christ than there are members of the Communist Party. More people have put their trust in Christ than have signed up to be members of the Communist Party. And so they have decided to persecute believers. And some believers are imprisoned. Pastors are taken away and thrown into prison. Others are removed from their homes and no one knows where they are. And yet, what is happening in China? The church is growing. Yes, people are saddened by these things and we should be saddened too. And we should be praying for our brothers and sisters who live in persecu per under persecution. We should be upholding them at the throne of grace and prayer. But we can rejoice with them that the church is still growing. In Iran at one point, the Ayatollah decided to throw Christians into prison to silence them. But in prison, like the Apostle Paul, they spoke the gospel to their guards and to their fellow prisoners. And many of them came to faith in Christ, so much so that the Ayatollah described uh, the Christianity. It was like a virus that he couldn't control. A virus that he couldn't control. It was a good virus. And people were coming to faith in Christ. So you see, here Paul recognises God's hand in his situation. In his present circumstances, they're not ideal. He didn't want to be in a prison. But he accepted that as of God. It was in the plan of God. Then the third place I want you to see the result and blessings of Paul's imprisonment. Paul knew it wasn't physical change that was keeping him, him in prison. It was the Lord's plan. It was the Lord's purpose that he should be there. It was the Lord who was keeping him there in that rented house. And owing to that very fact, he could rejoice. Paul had seen great mercy and sustaining grace in that prison house. That enabled the well-trained evangelist and missionary to cope with the confinement of being indoors, perhaps all the time. In the Old Testament, there was another one who was a prisoner, and that was Joseph. And Joseph spent about 13 years in prison. His brothers had intended evil towards him uh, because he was the favourite son of his father. But the Lord meant it for good. And he could spend those years honourably. And he could come to the attention of that prison warder who trusted him, seeing in him that there was a difference from the other prisoners. He could see the overruling hand of God. That is, Joseph could see the overruling hand of God in his confinement. And when he is released and when he meets his brothers, they are afraid and they uh, wonder what he's going to do to them. Since he's now Prime Minister of Egypt, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He could see the blessing of, God, of God's imprisonment of him, that God had a plan and a purpose for him. If and when troubles uh, come our way, and they invariably will at some point, I want you to see in those troubles his hand and his mercy toward you. He will be with you in them. He will help you in them. He will not leave you nor forsake you. It is Christ who lives in you, Galatians 2 and 20, who enables you not just to cope, but to rejoice in those difficulties, in those afflictions, in those persecutions of whatever form they may take. So remember that the Lord is with you in the middle of that imprisonment of whatever form it may take. And he is there with his grace and his mercy and his word to sustain you and to strengthen you and to help you to be courageous and to shine for him. But there's a second application I think we can say. Ephesians is not the only letter that Paul writes in his confinement in Rome. He also writes uh, the letters to the Philippians, to the church in Philippi and to the church in Colossae. And also the letter to Philemon about his runaway slave who had made 
his way to Rome and met Paul. Paul sends the slave back to his master with a letter to accept him as a brother. In Philippians, which is known as the letter of joy, we have rejoicing and joy mentioned 18 times. Here's a man who is under house arrest and he writes a letter praising God for so much in his life and in the life of the church in general. So here's a man who knows what it's to be in prison, but he's rejoicing. He's full of joy. He says uh, that he can rejoice at all times. Remember what James writes. And we've studied James, the letter to James last year. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. My brethren, my brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You see, the two men read exactly the same thing. As we think of Paul again, evidence suggests that after two years, Paul was set free and was enabled to go and do some more missionary work. Now, that seems fairly uh, sure and certain in that respect. But who knows what the Lord has in store for us? as we recognise his hand in our lives. So brothers and sisters, as we go out into the world, as we think of what uh, may happen to us, as we find out what does happen to us, let us see the Lord's hand upon us and the Lord leading and guiding and directing us in those times of trial, of difficulty and of persecution. May God bless these thoughts to each of us. Let us now close with the benediction. And now may the grace, mercy and peace of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, rest, remain and abide with all the children of God this day and forevermore. Amen.